as a minor. We're going to uh, start with our final event. That's the one they should do too. But please, you're all invited and encouraged to continue to take advantage of these delicious sandwiches. Well, we are very, uh, very, very fortunate to have with us Susan Trayman, who is the Director of Public Policy at, at the Business Roundtable. And you may remember uh, this morning that I mentioned as one of those reports that's gotten a lot of attention, focused our, uh, our attention on this uh, the critical question of math, science, education, where really is the country going? It was the Business Roundtable's report of tapping America's potential with a very ambitious goal. They want to double the number of science, technology, engineering, and math graduates with bachelor's degrees by 2015. Now that seems comfortably far in the future, but when you start thinking about it, it's not so far. So uh, Susan is, is uh, going to tell us how exactly they plan to achieve that. She has a great, uh, not surprisingly, has an extensive background uh, you were with the Department of Education, the educational research side, for a number of years. She, uh, interestingly enough, has a real perspective on this, and she must have been really in grade school at the time, but she also contributed to A Nation at Risk, that 1983 report that I mentioned that really did catch national attention and yet has not yet moved the country to make the right kind of uh, sufficient improvements. And I just, I don't know if I don't want to steal what you're going to say, but the Business Roundtable has been a leader really going back to the presidency of George H.W. Bush. As you may remember, he held a only the third ever summit between a president on the one hand and the nation's governors on the other. And the focus of this summit was on education. He brought uh, a, a seriousness of purpose to it. He intended to be known as the education president. And uh, from the governor's point of view, he worked with a then obscure governor from Arkansas who went on to become considerably less obscure. And in many ways, the emphasis on developing some sort of national metrics, national standards, and so forth, can be traced, I would say, back to the H.W. Bush through Bill Clinton and on to George W. So, and all along this path, the Business Roundtable has been a very actively engaged, not to say leading institution. Well, with all of that, Susan, let me turn the program over to you, and we'd be uh, just look forward to your remarks. Thank you, Kent. You know, Washington, D.C. has an alphabet soup of organizations, including business organizations. So the niche of the business roundtable, let's say, as compared to National Association of Manufacturers or <laughs> U.S. Chamber of Commerce, is that it's CEOs that are the member. It's only big companies. It's across sectors of the economy and its focus is on public policy issues that affect the economy. So it's a small set of public policy issues that businesses from every sector of the economy feel it's important for them to be at the table and part of the discussion and in influencing where our country goes. And most of our issues are the ones you would expect for big business, international trade, the environment, health and retirement, but as Kent said, in 1989, because of a challenge from President George H.W. Bush, where he asked CEOs to get personally involved in terms of personal time and company resources in improving K-12 education in the United States, the CEOs got into this issue. I wasn't there at the time, <coughs> but... Um, I'm told, you know, uh, uh, company lore says that the CEOs had a big debate about whether to get involved in this issue. And the reason is CEOs don't have a lot of time for public policy, and if you contrast 1989 when this discussion took place to now, they have even less time. The job has really changed. But they also want to focus on things where they can make a difference. And some of the CEOs said, how can you make 
a difference in K-12 education. It's a whale sandwich. You can't take a bite out of it. Well, those who wanted to get involved um, uh, uh, prevailed, and the roundtable spent about a year trying to figure out what's the niche of CEOs of large corporations. Many companies had experience with school business partnerships and came to realize that many of them were just feel-good community relations programs. If you were just looking at metrics for community relations, they were good, but they really weren't turning the dial, making fundamental change. And since Business Roundtable is a group that focuses on public policy, it was natural to say, where are the policy levers? And they determined, I think in a very forward-thinking way, that they should focus on states, focus at the state level. The U.S. Constitution gives states the responsibility for education. So in shorthand, they moved from adopting schools to adopting governors. And each CEO was asked to identify a state where they had a strong employee presence and where they could begin to um, uh, bring together the business community with a common voice on a common education reform agenda at the state level. Uh, and that has persisted, and many of the states still have those groups. Uh, it's only really in recent years um, uh, that we've gotten very involved in federal education policy. And that's largely because the CEOs felt that there had been sufficient movement at the state level that additional federal investment could make a difference and wouldn't just be, you know, putting money uh, into something that, that really wasn't on a path to change. Much longer story, but um, uh, fast forward to 2005. Um, uh, we see today a situation with multinational companies where CEOs are in a position to look out on the horizon, not at problems that are smack in your face, which tend to be the ones the American people respond to, and that's why a Sputnik <coughs> activates people. It's very hard to get people to look out over the horizon at what's coming. But with uh, the global economy, uh, with the changing demands in labor, with the fact that there's a global labor supply for talent, and the fact that it takes 17 years to educate an entry-level engineer, you know, 13 K-12 plus four for just a bachelor's degree in engineering, and uh, uh, the need for people with at least two years post-secondary for the technical workforce, even if they're not going on to a baccalaureate, uh, really seeing a very dismal scenario for the future of the standard of living in the United States if we don't have a more concentrated focus on the STEM fields. Everybody here is on this page. It's preaching to the converted. So I won't go into all the evidence, but you had report after report coming out with the same message. The CEO said, we don't need to come up with something new, but let's get the business community on the same page. And that's what Kent referred to, this report, Tapping America's Potential, <laughs> which um, we sometimes say is the Cliff's, ver uh, the Cliff's Notes version of the National Academy's Gathering Storm report. Uh, very much echoes those recommendations and basically says that if you look at what we need to do to bolster U.S. innovation, just honing in on the talent side, because there are a lot of policies beyond just those that relate to labor, that you've got some pillars you've got to address. We've got to motivate more young people to study these subjects and enter these fields. We've got to improve mathematics and science education in our schools and the quality of the teaching of those subjects. We have to keep our doors open to foreign talent because, number one, it takes a long time for the pipeline to move forward, and number two, 
we should be the place that the best and the brightest from around the world want to come to study and stay to work. And then finally, we need to bolster funding for basic research in the physical sciences, which had not been keeping up with investment in the life sciences. And when you don't have incentives for people to do basic research, there's a trickle down to the undergraduate programs, it, it goes all the way. So we've had a major focus on, number one, influencing public policy. And um, there's a bill that passed Congress last year, the America Competes Act, that essentially is the legislative version of the Gathering Storm report from the National Academies. A lot of hoopla, it passed, hooray, but the funding isn't there for it. So the big lobbying objective right now is to get the funding <coughs> behind that. It's really interesting if you look at the post-Sputnik years where you had lots of things going on. You had young, primarily boys, uh, looking up in the sky and seeing Sputnik and saying, I really want to go into my garage and blow things up. Um, uh, 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 apparently, there are tremendous number of incidents of kids blowing off their fingers during those years um, uh, that, that have been documented. And there's a, a film um, uh, called Sputnik Mania, that, a documentary that looks at this. But you also had public policy that inspired a generation of people who are now nearing retirement to become scientists, engineers, astronauts, and to go into teaching math and science in our schools. So we definitely see the need for signals coming from a piece of federal legislation that this is a national priority, that there's money in scholarships if you go into these subjects in college, if you go into teaching these subjects, and if you pursue those fields. So that's one track. But at the same time, we, uh, uh, in conversations with companies, um, many involved in efforts, especially in grades four to six, to go into schools to get <laughs> kids excited about science and engineering. What they found is kids can get really excited about space. Kids can get really excited about marine biology. Kids can get really excited about robotics. But if they don't get the message that if they're not on a path to pass at least Algebra II in high school, they're going nowhere in these fields. And so the math and science, especially the math, has been closing the door to the people who then might want to go on. And if you think of this as kind of a funnel, you're never going to have everybody interested, but you want to start out with as wide a group as possible. You don't want to shut that door where the fact that a kid can't pass algebra or doesn't even take algebra two in high school or doesn't take physics in high school means they can't go on in these fields. So we began talking to a firm called North Castle. They're in Stamford, Connecticut, that specializes in marketing to teenagers. Um, and um, we asked if we could begin to look at a strategy, a marketing strategy, that could motivate kids to want to go into these fields. Now, this is not a rigorous study. I want to emphasize that. This is a very small qualitative study that I'm going to tell you about. Just a few focus groups with teenagers looking at kids with high interest, low interest, high school, and middle school. And it builds on a model that this marketing firm has developed for reaching out to teens called a basic instincts model. And essentially what the basic instincts model is, uh, I'll tell you about uh, 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 as we go through this presentation. So we started out saying lots of things going on in math and science. You heard about them this morning, really exciting things about the curriculum, efforts in professional development, outreach, 
uh, even R&D money going into it, but not much on the student motivation side, although some of the projects that you feature in this program clearly are looking at that motivation. So how would marketers of common products that teens respond to, iPod, Nike, how would they go at this problem? How would they approach student motivation? Well, there's a technique that marketers use. They define the problem and the challenge. They try to understand what really motivates teenagers. They try to find common thread solutions, but they always think segmentation. So here's an example of segmentation. Some of you probably watched the Super Bowl. And if you have gray hair uh, uh, or you're a woman, so gray-haired men, bald men, women, um, uh, probably after quite a few of the commercials, you looked at the people you were watching the Super Bowl with and said, I don't get it. Well, you're not the targeted audience. The targeted audience are young men for most of those Super Bowl ads because they're segmenting to a particular audience. So that's what folks think about X with- plus Y plus A plus Q yeah. plus R just makes your mind spin. And that's not, like, it's not cool. We learn stuff about DNA, which is wonderful to know and all this stuff, but how many of us are really going to become scientists when we're older and work with DNA? The kind of preconceived notion of those words, yeah. like people who say math and science you think, Nerds, you think numbers, you think experiments, and you, you know, it doesn't all make that too much sense at first until you really get into it and you really start realizing like how it all works. I like being good at it, but then I dislike it because like people, like for example, my brother says I'm good at it. He'll, he'll always call me a geek or a nerd since I'm like really good at stuff like math and science. When you're in school, everyone's like, "Oh, you're smart." Ew. They just sort of, I don't know you anymore. I mean, you could have been friends with them back in elementary school, and you're like, all of a sudden, when you get to middle school, and you realize, he's smarter than me. I don't like him anymore. We're a civilization built upon appearance. Uh, like, we're all like, ooh, I want to be the next superstar, the next singer, model, dancer, whatever, next athlete, and it's all appearance. And having, like, the brain power to be exceptional in, or not, well, just wrong saying, or wrong way to put it, but, like, being good at math and science isn't as good appearing to other people, so we try and stray away from that, and sometimes it's even a negative appearance. They're like, ooh, you're smart. If you're good at math or science, just the stereotype is like, oh, if I tell my friends the answer to this, maybe they'll think I'm a nerd, and they'll think that I go with that group, and then I can't, they won't talk to anyone. Uh, up until this year, I've been I, I've been the quarterback of the football team, and it's it's if you go away from that, if you're not focused on that all the time, it's frowned upon because you're you're not dedicated enough, and you're not everyone sees you're not focusing on what you should be. If you are good and can be can become famous for that thing, then that is much better than going on to work with something in math and science <coughs> or work with something in ac with academic studies. Actors and, and sports players are really glamorized by the, the media and stuff. Like, oh. Stockbroker Illustrated does not come to my house. <laughs> <laughs> we put actors and professional athletes, they're kind of on the same level because, like, people, oh, athletes, they can throw football. And actors are like, you know, I mean, you gotta watch your movies, right? Actors and athletes, they get a lot of money. They get millions and millions of dollars. Well, a teacher, which is like really supposed to be important, like a doctor, they don't get as much money. Because I think that people get a lot of stuff for granted. <coughs> they're like, yeah, we have doctors, but that's their profession. We have teachers, but that's what they're supposed to do. They don't necessarily value because they take it for granted. They think that it's always gonna be there. I clicked too fast, but um, uh, essentially you saw these kids from different focus groups basically saying that in their culture, math and science has very low status. So people like all of us tend to think that <coughs> what you need to do to convince people is to give them facts. Tell them how great math and science is. Tell them 
uh, uh, in a very logical way. But one of the things about marketing to young people is that the voice of authority isn't an effective tool. All of you probably know that there is research that says teens' brains are different. They process information differently. And um, uh, uh, a lot of the work that's done on teen driving uh, uh, attempts to get at the fact that their brains are different and they think about it in different ways. So I mentioned to you that North Castle has developed <laughs> these basic instincts that marketers can appeal to. And there are five nice basic instincts and five naughty basic instincts. The nice ones are things like social connection, accomplishment, personal expression, belonging, freedom. And here are some examples from different campaigns. Um, uh, it's, I think, not the current campaign for the uh, Army, but be all you can be, you know, join the Army, taps into uh, um, uh, accomplishment. The naughty ones, and some of these are the flip side of the nice ones, are rebellion, risk taking, sexuality, cynicism, tribalism. Um, and so if you think tribalism is sort of the naughty side of belonging. And some examples um, uh, uh, of ads that pick up on the naughty side, ads for Slim Jim that pick up on um, uh, rebellion, Mountain Dew, risk taking. Think of all the ads that have people doing extreme sports. You know, they're appealing to that, that risk-taking instinct. So in thinking about this question, how can we elevate the status of math and science in teen culture, you want to think about what it is that appeals to these kids. Uh, how do you begin to raise the uh, power, the sense of power, relevance, and status? And what the marketers say is, how is it that you begin to um, uh, uh, you know, associate with what they value, um, uh, try and think about the end products, and try to connect the dots from math and science to, uh, from the classroom to math and science accomplishments. So one of the exercises that was done with the kids is they all were given they were in a room, and they were given little um, red, uh, like post-its, stickies, dots, and told to put the dots on anything in the room that had math and science as part of it. And of course, there were some things that were planted in the room. I put one on your glasses. On the electric car over there. Right here. Because. 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 You have to use math and science just to get the angle right. The walls are part of architecture, and for architecture, you need precise measurement. Boom, so that's how to light up in the space. Engineering to make sure that when they go up around loop de loop, they don't fly off. In order to create music, you need math. It's like the brain, it's so complex and like, it's really cool and it's science. Perfect frequency right there, that's what it's supposed to be. It takes an exact science to wire it. I mean, engineers need to make it, all the gears and everything, so that the clock 
ticks every second. I think it has to do with science a lot because of sound waves. The markers, it's how it like reacts on paper. I never thought of a marker being math and science ever. I've never thought of it in my life. I mean, that's a completely new concept to me. So one of the proposals coming out of that is when you're competing with the power of athletics, celebrity, being cool, not being a nerd, everyday communication to these kids <laughs> needs to help them see that math and science powers virtually everything that you think is exciting in your life. Um, uh, we've had a lot of feedback about this word meaningful, um, uh, uh, that, you know, there are a lot of things that are meaningful like religion and family. So, you know, that it powers things that are exciting in your life may be a better way to, um, to put this. One of the things that marketers do is they try to create a brand for uh, um, uh, something, you know, a brand Pepsi, uh, 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 a brand, uh, when you see an Apple, you think of, of uh, um, the, you know, a Mac, the Apple company. So what I'm going to show you is not an actual ad, but it's what's called a brand concept. Math and science knowledge may be taught in classrooms, but it cannot be contained there. It's a wave that resonates out in all directions. It's the powerful force behind everything that is and everything to come. From our tools to our toys, our electronic devices to our national defenses. Yes, quite simply, everything. Math and science knowledge knows no bounds. It travels through space and time, through thought and mind, from one brain to the next, sparking the smallest idea, as well as the greatest invention. All the while gathering speed and momentum to create an ever larger, ever more powerful brainwave. So what they proposed was this concept of brainwave, that all of the separate programs, all of the separate things going on around the country on math and science, all of the products, you know, going to an amusement park could somewhere have this brand of Brainwave. We are very far from doing anything like that. Um, uh, it's a very difficult thing to do to get people to give up their individual identity and selling their individual identity. Um, uh, it's a rare thing that, for example, a, a product, a computer like a Dell laptop would say Intel inside. But, you know, we'd like to be able to say math and science inside of, you know, all of these things so that kids come across it in their uh, everyday lives. But a lot of people are starting to think in this way, especially, um, I mean, you saw that presentation with the Girl Scouts, which was not specifically about math and science, but, but could be. But to begin to think, how does math and science knowledge empower me, to have teens begin to ask that question and to use the basic instincts in the messaging. So some examples. There are kids who are already there. There are already kids interested in math and science, but they may feel very lonely. They may not be in a magnet school. They may be in a community, in a rural place in the country, and uh, not have a social group that they can relate to. Well, there are all kinds of social networking sites and ways to reach out to make those people feel not alone and feel part of a community. And the honors group it, are really low-hanging fruit, and they have lots of choices. They can be <laughs> doctors and lawyers and stockbrokers. So capturing a sufficient part of the honors group Girls, we talked a lot about today. Um, urban at-risk kids, the, the, the group that's retiring in science and engineering are mainly white guys. We need to replace those retirees with <coughs> women and minorities. Uh, men too, 
but um, uh, the growing parts of our population. We can't just rely on the same demographic. Um, creative kids who often think, what would I do in math and science or engineering? Engineering is so linear, I'm creative. To help them see the creative aspects of these fields. And then kids that we uh, call distracted. You know, they're on their skateboards, they're hanging out. Uh, how do you capture that group of kids? So these were just some ideas of the basic instincts that you would appeal to four different groups. Um, and, and um, uh, you know, lots of discussion could go on around which basic instincts best match up with different groups. One of the interesting things about higher ed programs where they've been very concerned about retaining women in their engineering programs, when they make the reforms and the changes, the men like it also. So uh, uh, what appeals to one group, for example, uh, achievement and altruism with girls also is very appealing to boys. So I'll close there. I want to emphasize that uh, uh, I think earlier I heard folks talking about the demand side. You got to work on the demand side and the supply side. A lot of kids get turned off by math and science teachers who don't know their subjects. Horrible situation in higher education where Freshman and sophomore year, kids get professors who think they're weeding out instead of nurturing. Um, uh, a lot of changes that have to happen uh, in terms of institutional policy and public policy. But meanwhile, we need to get kids excited and interested and understand that really no matter what they do in the future, Every field is going to need this, this uh, basic foundation. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> Paul. Oh, this is fantastic. First time. Oh, we, uh, do we have a microphone? Just a minute. Sorry. <laughs> this is all. We again have welcomed a, a web audience, and we are going to oh, post and maybe, this on our web. Maybe well. I should say for the web audience, and I guess um, we can get this on your website. But uh, the presentation, uh, you can see it on uh, uh, a website, which um, I can just say it. it's one of these long, e long addresses. But why don't I'll just give it to you so That's that right. you'll have I'm it. Put this whole program on our okay. Web. Uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, I'm Paul Gnonis, president of FIRST, uh, and uh, this was fantastic. First time I've seen this type of marketing analysis uh, of this uh, teen audience, which uh, we were trying to address and so on. Uh, I'm curious, so what did the Business Roundtable decide to do with this information? I mean, it's a really good in insights, and these, as you point out, uh, Fortune 500 companies. Well, what's the next step here? Um, it's moved a little more slowly than, than we had hoped, but there's an effort by North Castle, this firm, working with um, some organizations that focus on uh, especially um, uh, uh, math and science. I think they're working now with EDC, uh, which is in either Boston or Cambridge, on uh, getting some funding from NSF to, first of all, build on this research, because it's very preliminary. You know, it's 162 kids. Uh, and then to um, begin a rollout. There are some very simple things that can be done right now. Every school and community could do the connect the dots activity. Just, just that. Um, uh, but uh, uh, it's much harder to get the companies to agree on a common brand. And it's the dream of every marketer. Some of you may have heard of the RED campaign, um, American Express, The Gap, other companies uh, uh, put out a product, a RED product, and a percentage of the profits go to uh, uh, support um, uh, um, uh, cures for AIDS. Um, but the reason that's so brilliant is you've got the common brand of RED, but it's still their own product. So we've been talking to a lot of the companies about how you could do this. 
we don't think it's realistic that a sneaker company would put the Brainwave brand on the sneaker, but maybe when you open the box, you could uh, have in it, you know, what's the math and science in this sneaker? Uh, uh, there's so many things that could be done, but it's, it's a, um, you know, I work with corporations and uh, uh, breaking into the folks who are responsible for the marketing on this, it's difficult. Even though you've got the CEO gung-ho uh, in terms of the need for the country and the future workforce. Yes. Susan, I think uh, business and industry is part of the problem. Could you use the mic? Uh... I'm sorry. I'm Michael Tomasello from Mesa. Michael. And I believe that uh, business and industry in this country sometimes is part of the problem. They're, they're enabling the, um, the issues to linger on like forever. And this is what I mean. Uh, because of the way our economy and our country and society is, we are extremely competitive and will continue to be extremely competitive. And our Fortune 500 companies have to pay attention to the bottom line. And that is why things move slowly when it comes to getting five of them to work together. I have a, a litany of companies that support our program nationally, and I love every one of them. And this isn't intended to be a knock on them. But sometimes they have, they have to pay attention to one thing. They have stockholders and people investing in their company, and they expect a profit. So, and I, and I said this this morning already, and I know my, my buddy here is going to say, will you stop using that line? But there was a CEO at ARCO named Lodrick Cook, who was one of the great philanthropy uh, models of, C of, of corporate America long ago before ARCO was absorbed. And he told me, he said, Michael, every time he gave me his check, that there's no such thing as corporate philanthropy. I want to see products from you now so they can help me make money. So, in saying all of that, you've done a wonderful job putting together this, this study, this opportunity. What, where we have to be next now, and I agree with my friend here, he said, what are they going to do with it? Mm -hmm. You're not going to do anything with it. It's going to sit there. It will. It'll, it'll wind up sitting there unless your organization and my organization goes to these folks and says, it's time to take a risk. It's, a it's time to look at the solution in a, in a much different way than we ever have before. We've ha we got to be a bit of a visionary now and really not know how we're going to get there, but we know we have to get there and stop all this talk. Well, I'll yeah. tell you what has happened, um, uh, uh, and it's not specifically related to this, but one of the frustrations in education is that there are a lot of great programs, but they never go to scale. And so there is now something called the National Math and Science Initiative, its primary funding right now is from ExxonMobil. They've picked two programs initially that were identified in the Gathering Storm report. Uh, one is the You Teach program from University of Texas, which takes math and science and engineering and technology majors and prepares them to go into our schools to teach. Uh, and the other one is um, AP, Advanced Placement Math and Science Courses, and putting in place incentives, financial incentives for both students and teachers to take these AP courses and get a score of three or higher on them. You could argue whether those are the right programs, um, but the uh, objective is to reach out to other corporations to get them, uh, the hope is to raise a billion dollars and then begin to add other programs to those efforts so that it is a united corporate effort. I mean, in some respects, um, robotics has had this, you know, uh, 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 I mean, FIRST has had this. 
you go on the uh, web page, you know, lots of company logos, lots of companies that have contributed. And there are other examples of lots of companies uh, coming into one effort. But the more frequent model is companies having their own thing. So this will be very interesting to see how the National Math and Science Project um, plays out. And in terms of the free check, it's enlightened self-interest uh, as far as corporate philanthropy. Um, uh, but there's a big expectation right now that companies uh, invest in their communities and in their workforce. And companies are vying for talent being a place that people are proud to work is important in retaining employees. And survey after survey shows that employees like to work for companies and organizations that want them to give back to their communities. I think you heard that from Booz Allen. Susan, I remember back in the 1990s that many people who were concerned about the lagging standards in math and science, the kind of things that showed up in the TIMS test and now you get from the PISA test and so forth. There was an interest, uh, maybe a fantasy, that instead of having only an LA law, we would have an, an LA engineering. Uh, you represent and work with companies that could make that sort of thing happen. There is a, a current example on network television, the crime scene investigators. And apparently, those are dramatic stories, and they have triggered an interest in young people so that enrollment in forensic science is, uh, is really just off the charts now. People are creating new programs to accommodate that interest. Could your companies, again, you'd have to look for a, a, a dramatic show, uh, you know, Who's the big winner? Who's the next engineer? I don't know what the example would be, but your companies could make that happen. Um, it's really interesting. Um, the National Academy of Engineering has been doing a marketing study of engineering. Uh, very interesting. I think it's on their website. Um, and uh, I mean, there are some basic things about just how does the engineering workforce talk about engineering? or talk about their studies in engineering. It's very challenging if you're willing to work really hard. I mean, all kinds of things that are turn turnoffs to kids. Um, and so uh, they've got a whole set of ideas about how to market engineering. And one of the things uh, in terms of the change from those days of like an LA engineering is Network television isn't the, the in thing anymore. Um, uh, uh, there are just other ways to reach out to kids, short videos. Um, just So this firm, I don't remember the name of it, um, uh, uh, basically has proposed to the National Academy of Engineering uh, a whole multifaceted outreach just on engineering, um, uh, 12 to $25 million. But an analysis was done, how much is currently being spent by the individual you know, mechanical engineers and electrical engineers and all the related groups, $400 million a year from all these disparate efforts. It, it, it's a hard number for me to think is true, but they say they've come up with that. So if you could get some percentage of that to not just be promoting their own thing, but the common effort. Now here's the problem. The engineers want to promote engineering. The computer scientists want to promote commu computer science. There's a group in Boulder, Colorado that wants to promote information technology to women. And where we came at this was nobody's going to be any of that if they don't get the math and science. In part, you know, this issue on the math and science is that it's so far back in the pipeline the companies are right now kind of panicked about just getting, or, or the uh, particular facets of the STEM field, about getting people to their thing. Um, that there's, in a way, competition for the, for the message. The, uh, I was at a meeting at the AAAS meeting in Boston a couple of weeks ago, and um, 
they were presenting this work on marketing engineering and somebody got up and said, you know, it's ridiculous if you think about the medical field, there, there is no like marketing effort, you know, be a cardiologist instead of a pediatrician. Um, uh, uh, but you do have in terms of the silos of the electrical engineers or the civil engineers or the mechanical engineers each promoting their own thing. Lynn Hawkins, uh, again, BAE Systems. Y you struck a, a chord there with, with talking about the, the connotation that math and science is, uh, in, in engineering is so hard. Uh, is there an analogy, an analogy to uh, language study, whereby if you start uh, language training or lang language study early enough in your life, it is much easier to do, and maybe the foundation isn't at the certainly isn't at the high school level. I think we realize that it's it's pre high school, but maybe it's back pre middle school. Well, if you think of mathematics, which essentially um, you know, it's it's building blocks, mathematics. Um, you know, kids start to hit a wall around middle school. Some of the researchers think it's because their foundation back in fractions is so weak. And, you know, if you think, okay, you can pass a test with a 70% and you keep going to the next thing, but 30% of the material you really didn't get, at some point it catches up with you. And then the math just, you know, uh, cuts them off from going any further. So you're absolutely right, having to go back. And probably if you gain more facility with it at a younger age, it just doesn't come across as something really hard. But back to the cultural issue, because higher ed can't get off the hook on this. Suppose you're a smart kid, you go to college, and you're undecided. You know, maybe you want to keep your option open to go to law school. So you know if you want to go to law school, you need a high GPA at college. And you know that all the math and science courses, they grade on a curve, and they're weeder courses. But the humanities courses don't grade on a curve. And you're a smart kid, right? You're trying to weigh this. So lots of cultural factors that just aren't the kids thinking that it's nerdy, that we've got to get to. The, the problem in education, though, and this, I think, can get so overwhelming for the business people, everything relates to everything else. And by the time you really think about it, you're solving world hunger. And they're like, please, you know, give me a problem that is manageable. Um, uh, so, you know, we've got to figure out a way to have not everybody tackling the whole enchilada, but a, a way that there's a coherent approach so that people are working on different pieces, but it all adds up. Susan, just let me make a quick comment on that Oscar Porter from Mesa. I think what we're really talking about here is rigor and relevance together. Right. I think the role for industry is the relevance role, not the rigor role. Now, they can provide the opportunities for how students can see themselves and their world around them in a different way. But industry is not going to be terribly helpful with schools of education right. in uh, changing their minds about how they ought to prepare students for the classroom. Uh, they're probably not going to work terribly well with that third grader who's who's on the cusp. So all of the all of the push points have to be pushed at the same time. But I think underlying it all is yes, engineering is a rigorous field, but there's nothing wrong with that. And kids will step up to a challenge if you present it in the right way. And I think you're starting to get at it with the what you showed, the relevance to their lives as they see them now and remember, now changes every 15 minutes, so that has to keep working. But it's that combination, if you can accept that this is really something relevant for me, then I'm really ready to work hard for it. You know, how many bottle caps do kids save so they can get that, that skateboard off that Internet site? 
you know, it's important to do that. Uh, and I think you're getting at this with this presentation, and I think that's the narrowing, if you will, of the role uh, that industry may may need uh, so it can move move forward. S continue internships, find different ways to give them uh, opportunities uh, as early as, uh, as possible to be exposed to, uh, to the relevance of what's trying to be taught in the classroom. And then where you can work with the teachers is so the teachers understand the relevance as well because some of the least well-informed people in the country about engineering are the people who are teaching math and science in uh, K through 12. Uh, in particular. I think, not that that's right, a wrap on them, right. that's not their experience. One of the things I think that folks are really trying to think about is that mentors are so inequitably distributed around the country. You know, not every school district has a, um, a, a you know, a high-tech industry, a cutting-edge industry in a close geographic location where kids could go for internships and mentorships or where business people could come in. Or it may be a location that is so dominated by one industry that they don't really get a sense of the variety of options available. So thinking about the internet, about social networking sites, about really different ways to connect kids to mentors and to be able to visualize and see what's possible. You know, technology is just opening that up. Now, nothing substitutes for that human to human. Um, but we've got to think about ways for kids who um, just don't live near those opportunities. If, if this were part of the role of workforce investment boards, example there's a workforce investment board every place you turn around even in rural areas there's someone responsible for that they tend because we've tried to work with them to view their role as getting people at the entry level into the workforce well you have to work at various points of connection and one of those points of connection is preparing people not to enter there but to enter right enter here and then you've got Things like MentorNet, uh, which has been extremely successful with uh, with young women around engineering and uh, and science, and they've expanded now to uh, deal with education disadvantaged students. And so there are there are some models out there that can that can uh, reach. It's a it's a matter of knowing where your expertise <coughs> lies and then working that area, not trying to be everything to everybody. Right. Um, Hope Harrington, uh, a, ver a lower level observation, but one that um, I'd just like to put forth. I think that the, um, the video that you showed, the marketing, the brainwave thing, is great. Um, and I, I suppose that's geared toward teenagers, middle schoolers and teenagers. Um, what about the idea of trying to market that to school systems, uh, and another video that would be geared toward um, elementary school children that could be um, introduced through their science and math courses and could be, you know, play, businesses could support that in individual school systems. Business Roundtable right. in each state could get to the localities to do that. Um, as a way to start getting children excited and understanding what math and science, these boring subjects, um, really mean. Here's what the marketing people said when we talked about that. They think there is a role for schools that would reinforce this, but they think if the kids first get the message in school, it'll be that voice of authority, and so it won't be as appealing. But I see that video as not being a voice of authority, but being kids talking to other kids and talking to the kids in their audience. It, it, it is, but if the person who shows it to them, that, that's the issue. I, I'm, not sure, I don't, I'm not sure I believe the, 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 the firm when I say this. I see some folks agreeing with them that, that they think it just won't be as effective if they they want them to encounter this first in the popular culture. 
that's the idea, to first encounter it and then have it reinforced at the school level. Because I wanted to start doing around the country the connect the dots activities. Because you know, I thought that would be great. Every teacher could do it. Every school could do it. And th they were really worried that, that that would be that voice of authority. Well, this goes back, I think, to this gentleman's uh, let's take a risk. Um, uh, stop with the studies and right. uh, let's do let's it. Move. <laughs> uh, so um, you know, why not try it? Well, we could reach out, for example, to the National Science Teachers Association. You know, to to groups that already have the networks of teachers, and and you know, just try a pilot. Yes. Yes. Uh, Hi, um, part of the, I'm one of the ones that was shaking my head. I'm Kathy Gorski. I'm one of the Einstein Fellows, and so I am a K through 12 teacher. They would see it as the voice of authority, but you put the vi the pilot on YouTube, and now it's in the popular culture, and it's something that we can do uh, that that the kids will look at. Now, my, one of the comments that I would have, and I'd said to one of my colleagues with the brain with, with the campaign. Why can't it be something that you have different types of buy-in? You're not trying to have the companies put it on their product themselves. It's on the box or anything like you said, or it's in the advertising, and the link is to the website. Right. And so that that's, in my mind, a relatively low-cost way to do. You've got companies that maybe want their logos on a website. You've got a Brainwave website. You've got products on the product website. And that lets you have a whole tier of engagement and involvement by companies. You're, you're absolutely right, and actually that is where we were headed, and, and we're kind of at the point of, okay, you get to the Brainwave web wave website, what do the kids find there? And so that's a whole, I mean, we really have to think that through because it's not just a, right. from the marketer's point of view, it's not just a, here are all the careers, here, you know, it's something very different. Yes. Yeah, two comments on that. The, um, oh, in the introduce yourself again. Oh, I'm Steve Smalley from Northrop Grumman. Um, when you get to the website, I mean, collecting bottle caps to read the codes on the inside is a huge thing, and that's an easy thing for product marketers to place on their packaging. You give them a sticker with a number, you go to the website, that number attaches them directly to that product so that we can go in and see how that product was made, how it was designed, something else. And there's got to be a giveaway. I mean, if, if you're not getting hits for how many times I've logged in, and right. Um, right. there's got to be some tie-in. But since you're directly marketing to and you're collecting data on who's hitting what kind of sites, I got a good idea that you're ready for a skateboard now. Um, there ought to be a way to get some, some giveaways that tie into that. So I think the website's a great idea. I think you make a very cheap sticker. You make it available to everybody. You're selling wallboard. You're selling sneakers. You're selling T-shirts. You can put a sticker on them. Um, and then, Airplanes. yep. I mean, <laughs> really, when you walk on that jetway, I mean, there, there's an opportunity right there where that door opens. You know, this product designed by engineers, Brainwave. Right. Um, and I'm sure Boeing has a great website that's designed exactly for K two through twelve. I mean, we're designing our own website for K through twelve. That doesn't make sense to have everybody out there doing their own. Um, and as far as piloting stuff on television, uh, Cyber Chase is a great elementary school. Um, site. It's on uh, public broadcasting. Um, PBS has two great ones, Cyber Chase for the elementary school and Design Squad for the middle schoolers. Mm -hmm. They design go-karts, they design um, water pumps, uh, kind of cool, exciting stuff. They've got a pretty hip cast and um, it's, it's, a, it's definitely public broadcasting, but it's pretty good. Uh, Lynn Hawkins again. Um, it, picking up on that, and then uh, you reminded me of something else that I kind of took exception with on, on Northcastle, and that is their comment about segmentation. Uh, it's not that a, at all anymore, as I understand it. It's indiv individualization. Right. And right. as you get into uh, the, the website and the webcasting, that allows that to happen very, very in a very special way, and a very subtle way. So the you, uh, your your comments and suggestions about YouTube, we could do that right now, and just get that on. Right. And in fact, and it would grow that way. 
and then and then the, the 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 demand would force the website to evolve along with it because it's it is going to get hits uh, but but then allowing the web to to grow this in a network fashion uh, and it, it allows what's called emergence to happen and individual individualization to happen and that's where it, where it's going to where it's going to make a difference, and your objective on the uh, uh, the the doubling the the education is way way low. Oh, I know, but I know it's low. But it's basically getting two hundred thousand to four hundred thousand. But um, we're creeping. We're creeping. Susan, I had a another question that was prompted by something that Oscar talked about just in passing, which was schools of education, teachers education. Uh, is there an interest among your members in working with schools of education uh, where, they're, where they are interested in adding to the preparation? Uh, particularly, I think, teachers headed toward elementary and middle school that it's my sense that many of the people who opt for elementary education were math phobic or math was not their thing and they are on the other hand perhaps had a gift at nurturing a gift with young children and often did not see themselves as being responsible for that third aspect of an individual how to be a productive member of society yet I think everyone would recognize your members, mm -hmm. uh, GE, IBM, uh, so forth. Is there, uh, is there an interest among your members or is there a potential interest among your um, members? I've seen more interest uh, for people who are worried about that on the professional development side, uh, 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 not on the preparation side as much. Mm -hmm. But on the professional development side, GE now has a major effort uh, focused in a handful of school districts around the country where they have an employee presence because there's a mentorship part of it on totally revamping the mathematics curriculum, the way it's taught. Uh, um, so big focus. Um, Intel, big professional development effort focused I think primarily at middle school teachers. Cisco has developed an online curriculum for professional development for teachers. So I'm just seeing more on that side than um, uh, on schools of education. And in part, if it's hard to change K-12, higher education, even harder. One uh question, I, you know you, you were talking about the weeding courses. Another uh, frequent anecdote, and as Paul reminded us this morning, the plural of anecdotes is not data, but it seems to be a frequent complaint that a number of the key uh, elementary classes in math and science, calculus and so forth, are often uh, taught by non-native English speakers. I know my own son had a uh, brilliant Russian professor for calculus and his instruction leader was Japanese and neither one of them were particularly fluent in English. They were fluent at mathematics. It seems to me that if you want to keep that pool broad you want to make sure not only you're not unnecessarily weeding but here you have perhaps the interest but a kind of uh, added and unnecessary hurdle. Is there, what, what's the answer to that? Um. The most of that is at big research universities where that happens. Um, uh, and there's a growing awareness of the problem. I know the University of California system is looking very closely at that issue. Um, higher education resists it, but I think if there were more accountability, more um, uh, uh, looking systematically at uh, retention uh, uh, in different uh, um, uh, uh, professors. I mean, you never want 100% retention. Kids change their minds. They decide they want to major in philosophy. 
But um, uh, if you consistently see that after kids take a particular course, they change their major, there's a problem. Um, uh, you know, some of this has to do with the incentives for the big research universities are to get research grants, and that attracts, you know, graduate students. Many of them are foreign nationals. It's a self-perpetuating problem, but there is a growing recognition, and you see in more and more of the big universities um, focus on freshman seminars, uh, you know, m more, more attention to this issue, but not enough. Well, if I don't see any additional questions, there's been a terrific set of questions. Thank you all. Would you please join me in a round of applause for Susan? <laughs> who I think we can say has not only given us some branding ideas, but several brain waves of her own. So <laughs> thank you, Susan. We'll make sure that well, that's posted. And Great. thank you all for joining us. And as I said, we hope to continue to work in this field. It is perhaps the domestic challenge long term for the American future and the American economy. We, we talk, you don't hear a political speech without reference to the American dream. In many ways that dream is really built on a solid foundation of education.